next on Rugby Wrap Up, the unbelievable force of nature that is Billy Meeks of the world champion, L.A. Giltinis. That's right, world champion. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Rugby Wrap Up. Matt McCarthy in Midtown Manhattan. Thank you for joining us once again. And we have the pleasure of welcoming from the West Coast on the beach outside Los Angeles, one of the major league rugby champion, L.A. Giltinis, a first team all star, Mr. Billy Meeks. Billy, welcome and thank you. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's um it's an absolute pleasure and unfortunately the sun's not quite out today but usually i am on the beach enjoying the sun and what la has got to offer so yeah thanks for having me well i i don't know if you noticed but i'm in the i'm trying to dress in team colors over here and and look kind of la-ish it, it, did it work yeah i think you've nailed the brief and i think our number one should actually look exactly like that next year so i'll get on to the management about that all right excellent excellent i'd like to see corbs dressed like this mm. uh but you know, you may have you may have thought that you were on a different show because we are referred to as the sexy bald men of rugby a lot on the street. That's the name of the show. And clearly, yeah. I am now number two. Clearly, we fit the clearly we fit the break. Look at that. Yeah, Far we got right it. Out. We got it rocking. So, you won the championship, man. I mean, you lift you lifted the shield. A, how yeah. heavy was the shield? And B, did you travel with the shield? Okay, so A, the, the shield is probably as heavy as it looks. It's not obnoxious. It's not it's not as heavy as you might think it would be. So it is carry aroundable. And B, I wish I could tell you if we carried around. I can't remember much of the week that <laughs> preceded the, the final. So I remember it popping up at different stages, but I don't think it came to Vegas. So, um, yeah, it was there for some of it. Because it... It went in Vegas. You guys went to Vegas, right? Of yes. course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We went to Vegas. Yeah. I mean, where else do you go? <laughs> well, as any Giltini would, you have to go to Vegas. Yeah. I mean, I joked about it with friends. Like, I'm used to sitting in a dingy pub in the back streets of Melbourne on Mad Mondays. And now I'm at the Wynn Hotel in Las Vegas after a championship. So it's a little different over here celebrating a championship. So it, it wasn't a, uh, an issue of, okay, we're out, we're at a bar, and then everybody started chanting Vegas, and then you guys just went to Vegas. It was planned to go to Vegas. Well, I mean, this is – a few people have asked me this. So they sort of dangled the carrot. Um, so Adam Gilchrist, our owner, dangled the carrot earlier on in the week that if, if we did win, that he'd take us to Vegas. Um, and then our coach, Darren, even mentioned it sort of – two days out from the game look you know remember if we get the win here we're going to vegas um and sometimes it's it's smart thing to do sometimes it's not but i think throughout the season you probably learned that dangling carrots for us is a, is a good way to get results so um yeah that's that's what he did and maybe that was that extra driving factor to get us over the line well you know you guys had a great squad on paper before the season even started but you did have to play on the field and that was a whole different thing, right? For a lot of you guys, the, the vastness of this country, the geography, but you did it and you did win. But it, it wasn't easy getting there. It wasn't. Um, you know, was, I think all teams had their struggles this year. Obviously, COVID played a big, big role in that. And I think for the most part of our preseason was done, a lot of it was done over Zoom at the beginning. Uh, everyone was in different parts of the world. It was a bit of a struggle getting here with visas. And, you know, starting a team from the very beginning, you don't have players at the base already so everyone's coming from somewhere so it's a that's probably the first struggle and then obviously fortunately enough we we got to go to maui for our pre-season and that's sort of where where we sort of started growing as a team building our connections and um building you know what what became to be in my opinion the reason that we won the competition which was a, a really strong culture amongst the boys and yeah there was a lot of ups and downs throughout the season but um yeah, they, they're all sort of just blips on the radar now that we've that we've won it. And there were some of those blips when you were actually banged up a little bit and out of the lineup, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I haven't, you know, touched wood. I actually haven't missed a game in about five or six years of professional rugby ever. So to break my face into the second round with the MLR in my first season was um, yeah, a bit of a shock to the system. And bit of a freak accident really it's it's not something that i've never been hit in my head that hard i've never been hit anywhere that hard to be honest um 
yeah, so it was just one of those things. Um, we both sort of collided and yeah, at the wrong time and both he didn't duck and it was, yeah, just a, a mistiming of um, misjudgment timing and yeah, I missed five or six weeks, but um, it was actually a good opportunity for me to work on some stuff that I couldn't in pre-season because I'd just come from London Irish. So the timing actually worked out quite well and I was fortunate enough to, to play the rest of the games of the year. You also made team of the week at three different positions, right? Yeah, I think I did, yeah. That's no small feat. So you're pretty easy going from the pack, if you will, to the to the back line, which a lot of people are just scratching their heads and saying, oh, really? Hmm. Yeah, I don't know if easy is the word. I think um, I think it's something that I probably don't want to do again uh, for a number of reasons. I think, obviously, I feel a lot more comfortable. I've played my whole life in the back line, uh, and that's where I feel like I can add the most value. But um, probably worse than the actual game was the training week playing it back row because I had to finally train with the forwards and the amount of stuff like shit I give them during the week about being forwards and they don't try hard and they don't train as hard as us. I actually had to sort of indulge myself in what they were doing throughout the week, which was actually really, really tough. <laughs> they do work a lot harder than us. So um, that was probably the hardest part. And then the actual game is sort of – it just – yeah, it sort of flowed in the right way for a back rower. Um, there was a lot of penalties at the breakdown. The referee was giving a lot of love to the defending team at the breakdown, which is a part of the game that I quite enjoy. So, uh, yeah, it was a good game for me to play in the back row, but I, I did say to DC in the change room after, I said, mate, I've, I've done my job. I've done it well, and that's that's enough for me there. I'm back in the centre, please. Do you, does it matter to you, 12 or 13? No, not at all. I think, I think over the last sort of three or four years playing back in Australia, uh, the style back home is more so your 12 is almost like a second ball player, which sort of suits the way I like to play. Um, you know, but over here, I feel like it's such an expansive game. It's sort of everyone in the back line becomes, t- gets their hands on the ball a fair bit and becomes a ball player. So if I'm at 13, I'm getting just as many touches as I am at 12. So I don't mind either or. Speaking of positions, I want to address something from one of your teammates because we have a different camera angle or a screenshot of a camera angle of your teammate, John, the rolling piano Ryberg scoring in the final. And if you look at this photo, sir, I'd like you to tell me whether or not there are too many guillotinis on the pitch before this try is scored. <laughs> and if that is the case, isn't this a penalty? Well, there's probably two ways that I'm going to argue this. First one is, is the dead ball, the goal line, counted as on the pitch i don't know i don't know the answer if that's the case then i can only assume because we do everything by the letter that six guys actually got off the field while (laughs) these six guys came on so out of shot there's actually six of our starting 15 on the sidelines so once again the guillotinis yeah you know what i'm gonna go with that i'm gonna go with that (laughs) answer i like that i mean you wouldn't you wouldn't bullshit me on this no this is absolutely not yeah and um, especially because no. you you wouldn't you wouldn't have sprung a photo on me like that. So. No, I, <laughs> I, I wouldn't do that to you edge. either. Yeah. <laughs> uh, before we take a break and come back with what we call our clubhouse clatter segment, uh, <laughs> you have the opportunity in your career to play for two of rugby's best characters, two owners in Twiggy Forest with the Western Force, who was actually started up Rapid Rugby, Rapid Rugby, I believe it was, uh, and now is kind of the Western forces back in action and Adam Gilchrist owner of the Giltinis and the Gilgronis. What, how would you compare the two or what are they like? I think, um, I think with any, got any people that have owned teams like these two, they're very, the, the only thing that I can find that is super, super similar is they're very passionate about their teams. When I was at the Western Force, obviously, as you mentioned at the beginning, we went through a phase where we were likely to be kicked out of Super Rugby competition, which obviously the Western Force is Twiggy's baby. And he was very passionate about rugby in Western Australia. And that was sort of what he fought for the most um, because there is such a great fan base there. And and then Gilly, Gilly, I've probably had more to do with, honestly, he... um, you know, he was the sole reason that I came over here, to be honest. I was umming and ahhing about coming to the MLR. I didn't know what the competition was like. And I spoke to him loosely through my manager, but he actually called me one day and said, let's go for lunch tomorrow. And I sat down with him for about an hour and a half. And after that lunch, and this was a long time ago, I was done. I said to my manager, I'm coming, no matter what, because he told me his vision for the team. Um, 
his vision for the MLR and what he'd love it to get to and just how much he cares about this LA franchise and the uh, Austin franchise. Well, I got to tell you, just from the outside looking in, I, I just look with petty jealousy. That's me. I'm just <laughs> so completely envious and just, oh, Christ, I wish I was part of that organization. But, but you know, I'm on the East Coast and I'm, in, in the, I'm a New Yorker. But I think a lot of people, are like they don't want to admit that they're as petty and jealous as I am, but that's exactly what it is because it looks like you guys are having a blast organization is cool i wanted to dislike you guys when you came into new york and you just it was like ah oh, you're nice too come on yeah come on yeah it's just it's just not fair. but it's it's rugby though isn't it so but hold on we got to take a quick break and then we'll come back with the questions that are going to tear you down brick by brick right after this if you're in new york city and want to watch some great rugby have some great food and some great times go to the world's best rugby pub the Pig and Whistle on West 36th Street. I've been blind since I was four. And I've never seen a beer commercial or a beer label. None of that stuff influences me. I drink beer because of the taste. And my beer is Pabst Blue Ribbon. It has the taste and the flavor. What do you think's on the label? I think there's a, a naked woman riding on a unicorn, jumping over fire. Oh, that's good beer. And we are back with Mr. Bill Meeks. According to Wikipedia, it is just Bill. It's not William. Is that correct, sir? You can go with whatever you want, but I prefer Bill. Thanks. Is your official name Bill or William? Will William. It William. is William. Yeah. Right. Don't believe Wikipedia, ladies and gentlemen. But now it's time for that recurring segment that we are just starting in this particular interview, our Clubhouse Clatter segment, brought to you by Gillies, the only beer to have when you're pounding beers because it's just delicious. And I have one here. These are questions that may or may not be from your teammates and are from the clubhouse. So, hey, shit. first one up. Tell us about the tattoo that you got after the final. Well, I can show you and tell you. So, oh, there it is, the Giltini's logo. Oh, that is beautiful. Still healing a bit. Yeah, this is, um, this is something we spoke about leading into the final, leading into the finals weeks, that if we won, we'd get a tattoo artist in and and we won. And then, I mean, it's easy for me to just fill up an extra spot on my arm, but there's a few guys that had to get their first tattoos. So that was a pretty funny experience. One of the boys, um, Christian Rodriguez, got his mate in to, to tattoo us. And yeah, he set up shop all day at our HQ and just worked through the boys that we came to get it. So yeah. So it, did to- everybody follow through? <laughs> oh, those that said they would did. Yeah. There's okay. um, yeah some funny spots, a lot of tattoos on bums and um yeah johnny ryberg got a pretty funny one on the inside of his bicep here so he can pretend he's drinking it <laughs> uh, so there's, some, there's some good ones excellent excellent all right that's question yeah. number one question number two the award that you won on giltini's award night yes uh the team spirit award i think it was called the giltini's team spirit award which um you know, I suppose you can look at it from a number of ways. And I think for me personally, it's probably the most important reward I could win because sort of my role in the team was culture, social, off the field, and making sure that we're all sort of getting to know each other as much as we can and have have a lot of fun off the pitch. And as you touched on earlier at the Guiltini, that's a pretty easy role because a lot of our mantra is have a good time. So um, to, to get recognized from my peers and from the coaching staff as someone who's doing that, then, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty good for me. Well, it, you know, it does set the tone when the team is named after a drink. The owner yeah. has a couple of – he's got the interest in, in Gillies and he's got the yeah. Gilbronis and the Giltinis. Yeah. So, yeah. And you're in L.A. and near the beach, so it, that's, that's a good job to have. But It's a very also, good job to have. It's also something that was given to you by your peers. Correct. Yeah. Right. Which is probably the coolest thing about it. Uh, yeah. No, I was really happy with that. What are you doing in the off season? And again, this is from the clubhouse. Uh, so 
besides chilling out and seeing what everything that LA has to offer, uh, got a couple of things going on. I'm actually going over to beautiful New York early next week. I'm going to spend a couple of weeks out there. Uh, New York Fashion Week's on. I'm, not, I'm sure you're aware of it. I'll be, I'll be just, on the runway. Just where you're at. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. So I'm, I'm coming to watch you. Um, so I do a couple, couple of days at New York Fashion Week, which will be really cool. And uh, and then besides that, I've just got my, um, this is a little plug here, but my, my clothing brand, Baldco, uh, which has got a second drop coming in about a month. So just working on the back end of that and making sure everything's ready and firing ready for the for the drop so yeah keeping myself busy as much as i can but uh at the same time just trying to relax and take some so, down time in essence what you're saying is that you're coming here to new york to try to persuade me to be a model for your new apparel. i don't think i can afford you for my brand oh you'd be surprised yeah. you'd be very surprised <laughs> <laughs> all right next question yeah. Uh, yeah. i got this this is just a, it's it's it says serial killer so I like cereal, always have since I was growing up. It's a big thing in Australia. And then when I came to America, I was mind blown by the cereal aisle. It just goes for it's days. Mind-numbing. And yeah. <laughs> there is so many different types. And I was like, well, I'm going to review them. I'm just going to review them. I like cereal. I want to see what they're all like. And I'm just going to give my opinion on what they're like. So, how does that go along with the diet of a professional athlete? Well, we train enough to pretty much consume what we like Fair to enough. a certain degree. So, yeah, we're pretty lucky like that. So I'm not condoning smashing bowls of cereal and it's going to get you yeah. fit and healthy because yeah. it certainly yeah, yeah. has a lot of sugar in it. But yeah, it was something that I started and people responded well to. And I think a lot of Americans were interested to see what I thought of the cereal over here. And yeah, it was just a bit of fun and something on the side. And um, yeah, got a pretty good response. Excellent. Secondhand clothing? You've done some digging. I, um, this is serious journalism here on Rugby Wrap Up, a.k.a. Know, sexy bald guys of rugby. <laughs> Oh, my dog's creeping I in. saw that. Little, saw that little peek yeah. in there. Hello, Leia. Um, yeah, the vintage clothing. So that's something that I've sort of um, gained a passion for over the last 18 months. And I've got a friend back home who's got a vintage clothing business. Uh, and he resells um, vintage stuff from the United States. And obviously, me being here, I've got access to um, you know some pretty cool stores. And LA has got some of the best vintage shops in the world. So... We sort of set up a little. Well, if you wear something once in LA, it's it's they're already getting rid of it, right? Oh, you can't exactly. possibly wear that outfit yeah, again. Oh, no, you can't. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I <laughs> I was in Venice and I took Johnny Ryberg down with me, and I was finding some vintage clothes. I was like, "Do you like this stuff?" And he's like, "Well, not really, because it's basically what I grew wore growing up. Like it's just old sports teams that I'm used to." And I'm like, "Yeah, that's fair enough." <laughs> um, so yeah, we just we just buy stuff from over here, send it home, and resell it. Doesn't that? Does, doesn't that just completely compete with your selling of new stuff? No, it's very different. No, this is this is targeted for glorious bald men like ourselves that are proud right. of being bald um, and embrace their bald side. But the, the vintage stuff is more streetwear fashion. And it also it goes back to you being able to play different positions. You can you can deal with different kinds of clothes. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly yeah. what it I, is. I get it. I totally get it. All right, and then <laughs> I got another question here. This is about Angus. Cottrell and his car in Venice. He had a surprise guest one morning and there's some footage. Yes. Uh, I'll try and get the footage for you. I'll send it through. Um, yeah, basically we moved into Venice uh, and we've got a few friends around this area and we heard what it's like. We sort of knew what to expect, you know, a fair bit of homelessness and just, you know, can be a dangerous area if you're in the wrong spots at the wrong time. But we, we sort of wanted to be in the thick of it. And we, we agreed that we wanted to live together in Venice with me and my fiance and Gus and his wife. And uh, within, I think within, it was in the second week that we were here, Gus woke up to go to training in the morning and they went outside and they sort of saw someone in the backseat of their car. And they were like, that can't be our car. Like, there's just no way. It's maybe someone sleeping in their own car. And he pushed the unlock button and it beeped. I said, okay, it's my definitely my car. And he sort of knocked on the window and there was this homeless guy sleeping in there, <laughs> sleeping in the back seat. So, I mean, you'll see on the video, but they were, Gus was quite polite. Dana was quite polite. And they sort of just knocked on the window and the guy opened it. He said, I'm so sorry. I thought this car was abandoned. Uh, and I just What kind of car is it? Just, well, that's the other side of the story that now we've gone back to the guilt engine and said, hey, these cars are being seen as abandoned. So we need to, we need to upgrade our cars. Um, that, that's what but, somebody could confuse my 1998 Crown Victoria with. Well, potentially, yes. I'm actually lucky at Crown Victoria and I.
Your car? Yes, That's your car. That's our car. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was open. I thought it was abandoned. I was cold. I was waiting for slept there. You're right. Full credit to the guy that was leaving the car. He was really polite. He said sorry, and he sort of just walked his walked away. And I think then you said, "There he goes in that vintage clothing." Exactly. And I tried to buy his t-shirt. Full circle. We just brought it full yeah. circle. Boom, boom. Yeah. Just dropped the mic. Writes itself. And once again, that was our first ever Clubhouse Clatter segment brought to you by Gillies, the one beer to have when you're pounding beers because it's so delicious. I have one here. You said you came from uh, a workout. I was just wondering, was that at an F45, Jim? No, it wasn't actually. It was at our HQ. Oh, all right. So that, that, that's the only place that you're allowed to go to other than if you're going to work Correct, out, right? Yeah. H- well, HQ. I live, I live a stone's throw from Gold's Gym, and I, I'm not allowed to go and train there or get a membership there because F45 would, is, is our second home. That would piss off Papa Gilchrist, and rightfully so, because yeah. that would piss me and off. You don't wanna, and you don't want to piss off Papa Gilchrist. No, you don't want to piss off Papa no. Gilchrist. And finally, no. um, uh, American talent that, you, that su- surprised you or caught you on the opposition or on your team. So I'm going to go with my team first, and I'm going to go with Christian Rodriguez. Uh, homegrown talent, a guy that has just been so impressive on and off the field. He's, he's really good for the team culture, but on the field, you know, unfortunately for him, he was playing behind Harrison Goddard, who obviously was one of our star players. So he, he probably got limited minutes and probably not as much time on the pitch as he would have liked. But when he got his opportunities, he was unbelievable. When we played Seattle away, he was man of the match, I'm pretty sure, that day. And I think he got team of the week. And he's just a guy with so much talent. Um, and I'm really excited to see him in the future. Um, and then for from another team, uh, you know, I was going to say, I was going to say Mika Cruz, but I'm actually going to go with Mikey Teo, um, you know, a bit of a veteran and someone who I weirdly, I didn't know too much about before I came over here. And even going into reviews and watching the way he played, he's quite unassuming the way that he comes across on video. But once you're actually playing against him, it's a whole nother beast. And I feel like players like that are just so much more special because they just have something in them that is just a game day thing that you can only experience if you're sort of opposite that guy. So I mean, rightfully so, player of the season um, and such an exciting guy to watch play. So I, I quite enjoyed the battles we have with him this year. Yeah, no argument here. No argument here. So yeah. uh, I want to thank you for taking the time out, coming on the show. You brought, it, brought, brought us up in class a little bit here again. And will you be back with the Giltinis next year? Or do you know yet? Correct. Yeah, yeah. All locked in. I'll be here. All right, great. We look forward to seeing you. And again, thanks for coming on. And make sure you say hello to the boys for me out there. Will do. Thanks so much. And that is Mr. Billy Meeks of the world champion, or at least the major league rugby <laughs> champion. We do that over here, Bill. Uh, I know. I've been saying the it world champion, major league rugby champion, Giltinis, and first team all star, Mr. Bill William Meeks. Thank you, sir. Much appreciated. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for this segment. Make sure you check out our other segments. We have a couple of special ones this week, including our interviews with the number one and number two picks in the MLR draft, our Rugby Town Sevens, and our crossover segment with Rugby Town, the American Raptors. Don't miss those. And, of course, our regular segments, including the Rugby Odds, featuring WWE Hall of Famer John Bradshaw Layfield, the world's best sports better ever in the Philly Godfather, and Rugby's Gift, Gift A. Bailu, our Major League Rugby Show, Martial Law, The Zack Attack, And please sign up for our Rugby Wrap-Up Red Cross Blood Donor Team. 